they are joining in. Okay, there we go. Let's see now. Okay, welcome everyone to our session today. We have with us um, Rebecca Karoff from University of Texas System and also Dean Hendricks of University of Texas at San Antonio. So before we begin, I am going to just go over a few uh, housekeeping uh, things that we have. Um, we will be having a survey that will go out to all participants uh, at the end of the conference. So if you would please, uh, when you receive the email, we would encourage you to participate in the survey. That will give us uh, an idea of how you guys enjoyed the conference and as well as uh, you know, what you would like to have seen or, or things like that. Uh, also, um, if you, there are questions that you have for the presenters, if you would place them in the chat and then I will pull them from the chat and be able to ask those questions of the presenters on your behalf. Um, also remember our code of conduct uh, as discussed earlier um, this morning that we have. So we just wanna make sure that people are reminded of that um, as well as um, the other sessions that we will have uh, by the end of the day as well as tomorrow. All right, so. Today we have with us, and I'm going to just read their bios here. Um, so Dean Hendricks, as Dean of Libraries, Dean Hendricks provides leadership, strategic direction, and vision for the UTSA libraries. Working with librarians, staff, faculty, students, and the broader UTSA community, Dean aligns the library's services, spaces, and expertise with the research, educational, community engagement, and public service mission of the university. Identified as one of the top 20 librarian contributors to library and information science literature worldwide, his research focuses on bibliometrics, research impact, data management, strategic planning, social networks, and e-textbooks. Dean earned a Bachelor of Arts in the Plan II Honors Program and a Master of Library and in Information Science from the University of Texas at Austin. Dr. Rebecca Karoff joined the University of Texas system in February, 2016 as Associate Vice Chancellor for Academic Affairs. She is responsible for leading and supporting student success initiatives system-wide. Her work addresses the student success continuum, PK through 20 and into the workforce and recognizes the remarkable responsibility and opportunity of the University of Texas system to achieve more equitable access and outcomes for the state's increasingly diverse students. She is the primary architect of the UT system student success framework, which is focused on student financial well being, effective advising, and deepening students' sense of academic and social belonging. All of her work is data informed equity-minded and quality-driven, and she is interested in expanded approaches to measuring student success. With Dean Hendricks from UT San Antonio, she served as co-chair of the UT Systems Affordable Learning Accelerator Task Force and leads the UT Systems Momentum Building Strategy on OER. I present to you our presenters for today. Thank you, Chandra. Really appreciate it. Can everybody hear me okay? Did you get the thumbs up? Okay, great. Um, yeah, I'd hate to be on a roll and uh, uh, all of a sudden, uh, you know, you tell me I've got to repeat everything. Um, 
like like uh, Sandra said, I'm Dean Hendricks, uh, Dean of Libraries. I'm not formal. It, 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 my name was actually Dean, and I am a Dean, so Dean Dean at UTSA. Um, I'm joined, obviously, with uh, as Sandra said, uh, by Rebecca Karoff, who's Vice Chancellor of Academic Affairs at UT System. And we've worked closely as co-chairs of the Affordable Learning Accelerator Task Force. And that task force was originally uh, conceived and charged by our former UT System Chancellor, uh, uh, Bill McRaven, uh, after meeting with the UT System Library Director. So we got a meeting and I think uh, we impressed uh, uh, Chancellor McRaven at the time. And he said, uh, essentially gave us a daunting task and said something to the effect, I think Rebecca, didn't he say, can you get me the cost of every UT student's textbooks, uh, what it costs them? And we were like, uh, uh, who knows? Uh, so, uh, but he showed a, a big interest. And so the task force was convened from uh, April uh, 19th through August 2020, where we completed a report that was presented to our new uh, current UT system chancellor, JB Milliken in September of 2020. And we'll talk uh, a little bit about that. And I'm trying to forward my slides. Let's see here. Oh, sorry. A little technical difficulty there. Um, so uh, for this for this session, um, we're going to provide an overview of the work of that task force. Um, and it was the, the result of the, all of the work in, in the ALA task force, the Affordable Learning Accelerator Task Force, was the development of our new OER momentum strategy. Um, because UT System is, is big, we're going to explain, you know, all of the uh, 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 obstacles uh, uh, to getting these recommendations and, and, and what our path forward is. And hopefully that might help uh, you guys inform uh, your um, uh, uh, you know, in your systems, uh, help you inform your strategies. Um, our objective was to develop a set of evidence-based recommendations and strategies um, to help build capacity and momentum around no and low-cost learning resources for students. And our particular focus was OER. I mean, that was uh, a lot of the people on the committee were librarians and uh, had experience in OER. We also, in this session, are going to talk a little bit about the unique environment that necessitated this report, you know, all of the factors. So that might be our student demography, uh, the UT system and, and, and its placement in the affordable learning space, the state of, Texans, state of Texas action in this space or inaction in many cases in this space, and uh, the current uh, commercial course materials market and uh, the growing momentum for open. Uh, as evidenced by this conference. So first we wanna know who's with us and Chandra, I'm gonna need your help uh, looking at the chat since I have uh, my windows open with my PowerPoint. So uh, we'd like to just know uh, who's here, um, uh, you know, your name, your title, institution, and, and maybe we'll, uh, just briefly, why why you uh, thought that this was interesting to you, so that Rebecca and I can uh, uh, hopefully tailor some of what we we talk about. So, as we go along, we'll uh, uh, maybe we'll give people about two or three minutes to put some things in the chat box. Um, but I will uh, turn it over to my uh, distinguished colleague Rebecca, and then uh, Shandra, if it's okay with you, we'll check back in with you to see who's here. Great, next slide then, Dean. Yep. Good afternoon, everyone. It's really nice to be with you. Um, I'm, I'd am i like to think you're as impressed as I am with this uh, inaugural Open Texas conference. It's been pretty phenomenal from what I've been able to, to see so far with an outstanding uh, opening keynote. That was amazing from Dr. Pollard. I wanna talk a little bit about, just describe a little bit about our, six, our, our university system. I don't know how many of you are going to be from actual systems in this meeting, maybe not so many, but of course, Texas does have six university systems, including the hosts of the conference, the University of Houston. Um, so, but the UT system has eight academic institutions, including five Hispanic serving institutions. We also have six health institutions. I work almost exclusively with the academic institutions in my role. And I will say the task force work has focused largely on, on the academic institutions. Um, we have almost 240,000 students in the UT system. 
again, a large majority of, of which are enrolled at our academic universities, including about 181,000, almost 182,000 undergraduates. Some fall 2019 data, and, and it hasn't really, we're about to get sort of a, snap, a look at the 2020 um, statistics. Actually, others have them. I haven't seen them yet. So, but it won't change that much from what you're seeing on this slide. We had about 55% of undergrads in the UT system count as underrepresented minority students, mostly Hispanic students. Um, so, and in a couple of our institutions, actually, our two border universities, UTEP and UT Rio Grande Valley, um, Latinx students account for roughly 92% and 87% of students. So you get a sense of um, some of the, uh, how, how much, the extent to which some of our universities really reflect the demographics of the state. 53% of our student received need-based grant aid on average, and undergrads at our institutions um, receive Hell in the range from 23% at UT Austin to 62% at, I can't remember which campus, might be RGV. Next slide. Um, so Dean started to talk a little bit about the task force and you heard some, a little bit about the origins for this task force. Um, we really were, were convened and to some extent we were, we were sort of charged by our previous chancellor, Chancellor McRaven, but we were able to also within the system office and in conversations with Dean and a few other library deans kind of set, our, set some of our own directions and determine what the purview should be. So we really were convened to elevate awareness of and deepen engagement with existing high quality open educational resources, identify strategies and collaborative opportunities to expand the adoption and development of affordable and next generation learning resources, um, including in the next generation resources being some of those sort of course materials and learning resources that are actually being pushed pretty heavily by commercial publishers, but just trying to figure out what directions did we want to take as a system. We want we set out to evaluate and identify metrics to assess the impact of OER, um, and we were looking to identify funding opportunities to amplify the work of, of um, on behalf of student affordability. Um, so as Dean said, we really focused quite a bit on OER, almost more than, and our recommendations will actually reflect that. Next slide, please. I wanted to just share with you the membership, but we might even have a few members um, in this session, which is lovely. We, we do. One of, the, one of the beautiful things about this task force, well, it went on a little long, but um, the diversity of, of roles, constituent, vo constituent groups, groups, voices that were represented on this task force was really phenomenal. So we had in people from each institution. And what was nice is that we might have sort of, I don't think we asked for as many people as we got. We sort of grew bigger because people wanted to be a part of this conversation and work. And that was really phenomenal. Um, but you'll notice that we have institutional representation from the eight academic universities. We also had um, representation from the systems faculty governance group, the faculty advisory council. And we had, we originally had three students from our student advisory council. One graduated, one never quite, I don't think he really quite showed up, but we had the third one who really was there with us until the very end. Um, and the student perspectives really enriched the group. And we actually had some good engagement in the work through not, not just members, but the system student advisory council who provided some input and testimonials. Um, we had one, one specific role spot for the li a library director, director. It turns out we had multiple deans and directors of libraries, which again was, was hugely um, important. And then we had several folks from the UT system. So again, I just wanted to share that, that screen of the, we wanted to just show you the membership because it really was important to have so much, such strong representation from across our, our um, institutions. Next slide. <clears throat> So we don't have to tell you <laughs> some of what we're going to tell you here. I think you know this, but I do want to address sort of the systemness aspect of our work. And what's always been true, and I don't know, again, how many of you work in systems, but university systems are catalysts for change because they operate at scale in terms of the students serve. They have the capacity for collective impact, although not every system will embrace that. Um, and systems can really drive cultural change and share the responsibility at this moment in time to address systemic inequities and institutionalized racism present in their institutions as well as society at large. And I take that role and responsibility, many of us do very seriously 
especially now we are living, as you all know, as we all know, in a singular moment where we have this pandemic that is now, you know, sort of officially a year old today. We have the Black Lives Matter and racial justice movement that sort of came to ahead this past spring and summer, again, because of violence against black people and other people in communities of color. And then we have this fabulous sort of movement and momentum around open, open education, open scholarship, open data, open science. Um, there is just such a beautiful um, coalescence and, and I think Dr. Pollard call it a, called it a confluence. So um, we felt really a, a great sense, especially as the work of the task force went on and then culminated in the report and recommendations last summer of um, you know, the case we could make about what's going on right now and why greater engagement with open educational resources is really more important than ever. And we don't have to make that case to anyone at this conference, but I think we all know that we still have a case to make at at our institutions with executive and other levels of leadership, perhaps with faculty, with staff, with governing boards. Um, so this was really the context. We view all of this as a context for the work of the task force. And as the events of the, the country unfolded during the course of our deliber de deliberations, research and recommendation development, I think the urgency really became greater. Dean, I'll turn it to you. Sure thing. Uh, just, just a note, uh, uh, Chandra. I, I did. I end up did have the chat up, so I am able to see. And what I what I'm seeing is uh, Rebecca is mostly people are curious about what UT system is is doing. Um, how people want to know, you know, what are the best practices uh, uh, to uh, get faculty to uh, adopt OER. Um, but I think the overarching thing that I'm sort of intuiting from the comments is. You know, how do you change the culture? I think Jesus Campos, who I, who I know well from uh, South Texas College asked, you know, how do you, how do you create a culture that is around OER that is positive? And, and that's really a, a big part of this committee was to get these people together so that system-wide we had this culture uh, across. So uh, uh, I, I read everything. Oh, also another one I wanna call out is uh, Lisa Lewis at uh, uh, A&M Corpus Christi saying that A&M system is thinking about uh, doing a, a similar, and we would be happy to to, to meet with your group, uh, Rebecca and I, and, and share. And we've got people like Art Brownlow on the call, who just essential uh, committee member uh, that uh, can can help. We just what, what we found was a wealth of knowledge uh, uh, in our group. But let me let me uh, get get to the matter at hand, which you know kind of lays out the. Um, and and again, I, 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 I at the risk of preaching to the converted. I mean, we know that, as Rebecca was saying, that our Latinx and, and Black students face economic barriers more acutely than other groups attending college. Um, the United States Census in 2016 reported uh, that median income for Latinx households was 19% less. For Black households, it was 33% less. So the downstream consequences of that is uh, in these surveys, and including the United States Census in Pew, um, surveys is that they're more that Latinx and Black uh, households are, uh, or students, I should say, are more likely to financially support their families. They're more likely to take out loans and take out bigger loans to finance their, their student education, and as a result, will hold more student debt than other classmates. Um, as uh, Rebecca had mentioned, uh, you know, at University of Texas San Antonio, I can speak, but I also found this out from my colleagues during uh, uh, our meetings is that we have large, uh, 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 a large population that's Pell eligible, which is in need. And we have all these anecdotes, but it, to get all of those anecdotes and all, and then the data together was a really powerful thing about this, this group. I mean, I think we, we all know, know that, you know, surveys of college students indicate that they'll avoid paying, you know, they'll go to great lengths for uh, avoiding paying for, for textbooks, including, you know, putting off certain courses, you know, going without course materials. And as a result, their coursework suffer, the student success outcomes suffer, uh, workforce, workforce preparedness suffers, and COVID has made this worse. And I know that I heard in another, um, uh, another uh, session today about what the, the toll COVID has, has, has taken on our students. 
Um, you know, some of the, the things that I've read is, you know, prior to the pandemic, about 58% of students worked on on campus jobs and, and uh, uh, of those students, about 42% lived at or below the federal po poverty line. And the substantial loss of on-campus employment um, due to A, budget cuts that I think we've all probably had to experience over the last year, and just the, uh, the uh, different way we, ways we work um, you know, things that are in the physical, I can just say from a library's perspective, we don't need enough students if we're not running a 24-5 library operation. Um, if we've uh, truncated our hours or we've limited our, our footprint, you know, the, the, the person power isn't, isn't needed. So what happens is across the, the, the country is there, this just exacerbated students' financial hardship. It makes them challenged to meet their basic needs let alone paying for tuition and, and, and textbooks. Um, you know, obviously we've, we've all probably seen on our campuses food insecurity, housing insecurity. And so, um, you know, any little bit can help. And that's one of the uh, big impetuses for our, for our uh, group. So at the UT system level, um, you know, we, we, we had to start when we had our group together is where are we at? Like, here we are, disparate uh, universities across the state, everything from UT Austin, the flagship, to uh, UT Permian Basin in West Texas, one of our smaller uh, UTs. Um, we, we had a lot of different needs. So where are we at as in relation to affordable learning on our campuses, OER and SB 810, which I would imagine people are familiar with, which is uh, 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 now no longer SB 810, it's the law. Uh, so um, uh, that deals with OER and course marking. Um, we had anecdotes and I think it all started with anecdotes and we did have the uh, coordinating board in Virtual College of Texas's survey of higher ed uh, institutions, which about a hundred institutions. So we, so we had something, but it wasn't um, systematic. So we conducted an environmental scan of our universities in the UT system. So we could see our strengths, our weaknesses, gaps. And of course, when you see the gaps, those are the opportunities as well. And our major conclusions uh, were these, that everything was built at the grassroot level at, at each campus. So, you know, that, that, that's kind of a duh. Uh, uh, but what ends up happening is that everybody develops their own oversight mechanisms, their own investment strategies, their own methods of assessment. So when I am talking to Becca Bickle at the, at the University of Texas Arlington, and I say, hey, our four-year grants, we've saved $8 million, and she says $2 million, and I say, wow, we've both been doing the grant program for the same amount of time. What's going on? Uh, why are we saving so much more money? Um, it had nothing to do with uh, uh, my brilliance or anything. <laughs> it, it had to do with the way we were evaluating an assessment. Um, and I'm not brilliant, by the way. I just was saying, saying that for saving $8 million versus $2 million. But um, most UT uh, system institutions uh, were in their nascent phases um, and activity varied widely. I would say that UT Arlington was the front runner. They were kind of the vanguard for the whole UT system. Um, they, they did a lot and, and then, uh, there were a lot of us, then there was a group that was probably, uh, uh, had, had some OER activity, uh, as well. Um, and then there were some that were just starting out and that was the vast majority. What we also found out is UT system faculty awareness of OER was low. Um, we reported at every school reported less than a 10% adoption rate of OER at, at their campuses. Um, and we, the, the thing that we, uh, was a part of all of our recommendations overarching, the smaller, more resource constrained UT universities had less OER activity and necessary infrastructure and thus would benefit more from a, a system wide strategy. Um, I think, you know, despite, uh, all the progress uh, that, that we had up to that point, um, it wasn't 
it, you, we needed to uh, be able to help these small, uh, kickstart some of these smaller institutions or institutions that, that weren't small, but just hadn't done it. I, like I would say the opposite happens at UT Austin is it's so big that it's hard to, uh, you know, each college almost has its own, uh, it's its own self-sustaining uh, business at UT Austin. So they have a hard time of overarching co campus coordination period. And whereas uh, uh, a smaller institution like Tyler is, you know, probably the faculty know each other better. It's probably a, a tighter, a smaller group, obviously, but uh, don't have the resources to continue. And, and this was reflected actually in our task force too. Some of the task force came with a real deep understanding of OER and, and some did not um, as, we, as we started. So it was really interesting to see the different perspectives. Our other finding was that momentum was growing in, in, in Texas. Um, you know, we, we understand as, as those of us in higher ed or in the nonprofit that uh, the general public and, and their representatives have been calling for, the call, for lowering the cost of higher education. This is a, a bipartisan issue. Um, you, you had, I think when Rick Perry was here, flat rate college, the flat rate college degree, tuition freezes from various governors and, and changes to tenure and promotion systems. Um, you know, one thing we, we did notice uh, is that Texas was a little bit behind. Um, you know, we had passed SB 810, but we definitely weren't at the, at the level of California, New York, or Florida, uh, as far as uh, systemic uh, um, proposals to, to address textbook costs. Um, and I think, I think this, you know, reality, um, you know, that we were a little bit behind kind of forced us all to really just, you know, carve our own way. I mean, I think when we had our UTSA had the first uh, OER conference, I think, I don't even remember when that was 2018, November, I think. Um, and I met people like Nathan Smith, one of the founders of this, this group. Um, you know, it was awesome to talk to people, but we had all been doing these things in our own little silos. And I think that was, you know, we wanted to start at the UT system level to, to get everybody together. So why we thought it was uh, the right time is obviously Chancellor McRaven was interested. He saw the value proposition in this. And it's great when you have the, the top person in your system say, I want you to, gives you a, an assignment that is almost impossible to, to quantify, but at least he, he, he understood that there was a lot of potential in this technology and in this movement. So um, there was a greater embrace of open education, especially by uh, the, the UT library directors who had brought this to the fore, but also us joining the Texas Library Coalition for United Action that's working on open access and, and transformative agreements with uh, scholarly publishers. Um, our student advisory committee's advocacy and their letter of support, um, uh, Rebecca and I went to talk to them the, the, they call them the SAC, Student Advisory Committee, the UT system. They were an ally, and, and so it was very important for us to address our student concerns. The legislature's recognition uh, through statute and, and, and having us, uh, uh, you know, I know that I uh, pounded the pavement there for two sessions talking about OER and inclusive access just to educate chiefs of staff and legislators. And then uh, uh, the coordinating board. I think coming on, I think their commitment to hiring Kyla uh, Torre um, to support OER development and, and digital strategies. This is also something. And then that Governor Abbott had designated uh, OER development in the gear funds for Texas higher education institutions. And I'll go to the next slide. And I'll try to hurry it up, uh, uh, Rebecca. I see that I'm using the time as I'm want to do. Um, all right. So obviously, the also the, the publishing landscape, you know, publishers also saw what happened with, um, I will just call it the Napsterization of uh, music and, you know, content in the digital world is something that is uh, precarious and, or maybe not so with M NFTs. I mean, this is like a new, uh, new thing that's just uh, taking over my, my feed today. Um, but <laughs> Uh, textbook, what we know and what in working with textbook publishers to get affordable solutions, I've been working on it from when I was at University of Buffalo since 2010, is they were stalling. They didn't know how to monetize this. They were giving excuses. 
uh, two libraries and academic innovation teams. And um, what we've seen come out of this aren't things that necessarily benefit the student. They're you know, uh, uh, business models like inclusive access, which in access codes, which many of you know, and those do have the ability to reduce educational costs and provide consistent access to, to learning materials. However, those business models also have a very strong potential to replicate the same structures that led to high prices in the first place. Um, so that is, they also are in almost every publisher. In fact, if you talk to Elsevier, they won't say they're a publisher, they're in the analytics business. They're collecting and selling student data. Uh, they're limiting student choice. Uh, making it very hard in many cases to opt out of automatic purchasing programs. They're limiting students' access to content. So there's a limit on printing, limits on types, limit on the number of devices you can put, you know, uh, a, a textbook on. There's expiration of, of access to content. And those kind of run afoul of uh, librarian ethics uh, in many ways. Um, and then the, the price increases built into contracts, you get locked in and you know faculty inertia is a powerful, powerful force. So if you're locked in, then you might be locked into these price increases as uh, uh, you go along. Um, so with all of this, all of these new business models that are being put out there by the commercial publishers, we wanted to have a unified strategy because we didn't. And what we found out is, a lot of these decisions are being made in a vacuum in a department at a university. So it's at a very low level where people are making calls on uh, sometimes what can cost our students upwards of $500 a year uh, for, for a fall and spring semester if they're locked into one of these access agreements. So we, we wanna make sure that $500 is not the difference between somebody uh, enrolling at our university and not enrolling and those decisions not being made in a vacuum. So that encapsulates the unique space that that we that kind of built around. Uh, and now we'll talk about the recommendations. Thanks, Dean. Um, you know, I, I do want to say in some ways, some of what Dean just shared is really, it, it sort of um, is a good synthesis of many of the conversations that we had as, a, as task force members. We, you know, we, we were a diverse group of people. We didn't always agree on certain kinds of approaches and strategies, but we did at the end of the day coalesce around 11 recommendations in the report. Um, and it, the report begins with an overarching recommendation that is sort of um, then unpacked in the other rec the, the 10 other recommendations that flow from it. Um, and I also want to be clear that this report and the recommendations, in some ways, it's it's setting future directions. We don't have all the answers yet. We didn't we didn't arrive at every single solution or strategy we knew we needed to adopt, but we do did arrive at understanding that we better do that sort of less siloed and more unified strategy making that would help um, benefit our students and, and build the momentum. So the overarching strategy is really all about investing in a, in a commitment to OER to build that momentum. And we, we, we were very intentional, of course, in the language such task force always are, but we really want to leverage and wanted to leverage and amplify the commitment of, and leadership of UT institutions for the work that was already underway. We were, this isn't a report that accuses anyone of not doing enough. This really tries to recognize all the incredible Incredible work already underway. And we had to make that clear to people so that it didn't feel like um, this is some system report that's telling campuses what to do. No, this is a system report developed by campus members telling everyone what was already being done and how we could um, really make that collective impact even greater. Um, and it really, the, the report and the recommendation tries to embrace the innovation that's already out there in terms of the UT system's growing strengths in online educational delivery and adaptive learning and some of these new generation learning modalities and resources. Um, so, and while we did all that, we also had to really be very mindful um, and the report has some real repetition to this fact that some of our institutions, as Dean said, are smaller. They have far greater resource constraints. Some of what we're re recommending would be such heavy lifts for them that we will need to provide the support in doing so. So the first, I'm, we, we should move quickly, Dean, I, I think through the recommendations and you can see for yourselves that first one is really about the financial investment we're asking institutions to make. And there are three different strategies recognizing what's already out there to a certain extent with the, with the governor's 
year funding and the incredible leadership and capacity building of the coordinating board right now and, and OER opportunities. We would love to go to the Board of Regents for an ask, but that's something that's so you know, way above my pay grade about whether you get to do that or not. Um, and we really are hoping that institutions will, will also commit their own resources in ways that, for example, actually all of them are starting to do that, but UT San Antonio and UT Arlington have been the leaders. And notice the and or in the, um, between those three bullets, because it, again, this isn't, we're not mandating, mandating anything in this report, we are making recommendations. So next slide. Here we have, I'm just gonna move quickly. We have a recommendation around adopting an affordability mindset across the UT system. And this is this was a, a recommendation that is both sort of symbolic and has a set of actions attached to it. Um, and we are plan to really unpack this as we move forward and, and sort of as we move forward and with, with implementing some of the recommendations. And we'll tell you at the end sort of about the process for moving forward. Um, we wanna do that kind of assessment, assessment, a shared assessment or some shared metrics around how we assess OER impact, both in terms of ROI and learning outcomes and student success outcomes. And of course, sort of some of the quali qualitative information. I think the qualitative assessments are easier to, to get to the some of the data driven um, impacts. We don't have good ways of capturing that across the system, although some of our institutions are doing some work there. And actually, nationally, nationally, we know the research is just emerging on some of these topics. And so we look forward to being a part of that um, research agenda. The fourth recommendation, um, we want to adopt a more coordinated approach to increasing the use and development of OER homework sets and test banks and establishing better infrastructure across the UT system. This was a huge topic of conversation and debate in the task force. There is a paucity in some disciplines of the homework sets. This is why everyone goes to those commercial publishers and invests in um, so-called inclusive access products and in access codes. And we, and we wanna be able to develop some in-house but that's hard work, so we'll see where we get up, go on that one. Um, next, I think this is Dean again. Yeah, and, and we wanted to uh, uh, adopt a, a coordinated approach to educating all UT, UT students, faculty, staff about uh, inclusive access, because like I had said earlier, we uh, uh, a lot of the time, if faculty didn't know uh, they're just looking for an easy way to um, uh, teach the course in some in some cases. Um, uh, so we, we wanted to educate them on the downstream consequences of possibly in, uh, of in inclusive access. So um, this may include uh, automated purchasing programs, uh, access codes, online bundles, automated grading software. Uh, even new new print textbooks. Uh, we wanted to to make sure that these proprietary approaches uh, that our our faculty were were educated on this, and, and that there were uh, some uh, guidelines from uh, UT system. Um, I think one of the things that came out in, in a disciplinary way was that um, uh, we had some resistance. Uh, uh, to us, I guess, uh, painting proprietary uh, uh, course materials in a bad light because some of the STEM and business disciplines said that the, the, the only quality ones are in these. Now, I think there's probably people here that could debate that point, but in that, this was part of that give and take that we had in, in, in the group. Um, and we wanted to, to also affirm that uh, we are committed to faculty governance and academic freedom. We just want everybody to have more information rather than less. All right, I'll go to the next slide. Oh, no. Oh, uh, no, I'm going recommendation number six. Sorry. Um, the other is, how do you incentivize people to use OER if they're, if, uh, you, or to create OER? Um, we, we thought that tenure and promotion was, uh, one of those ways we could do that, and that um, we held as a core value, and we will. This is unbending. Our guiding principle was we valued the faculty's authority over curriculum and decision making on all course materials, and we also recognize that tenure and promotion decisions are made locally by department and colleges. And with that, 
we had a partnership with our faculty advisory committee at the UT system and had representatives there so that we weren't overstepping. Again, you know, these it, it, this was not only a, about creating recommendations, but also a, a very political process and still is, right, Rebecca? Uh, and um, so uh, we wanted to just make sure that if a, a faculty member at UT, our recommendation is if they're creating an OER, that they're recognized the same way as if they were creating a peer reviewed uh, textbook. So we wanted that on the you know, formal tenure and promotion policies, uh, recommend that that be something that, that people would consider. So again, it's getting that information out there because again, we, you know, uh, this was from a, a, a UT system committee. We don't want any uh, 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 image of, of UT system trying to overreach. We want every campus to make their own decisions, but we want to, again, give them information and say, these are legitimate um, uh, scholarly works, and we want them recognized as such. Then recommendation seven is something that uh, we're, we want to emulate. Uh, it, this is kind of a moonshot, to be honest, uh, because we're, we're at varying levels. but. I mean, I think when you are setting goals, I think it's good to set really high goals because then if you don't make them, at least you got to a certain point rather than setting low goals. And the, the, the high goal that we've seen are community college people. And, and again, Nathan Smith uh, is a good example at HCC is the Z degree. Um, we, we want some of us, you know, we wanna look at that. And though we can't do it for our whole curricula, how can we find pathways in our core curricula um, uh, to, find, to find ways to have OER textbooks? And there's different strategies, including one that you know, uh, you know, uh, we use at UTSA, which is to incentivize uh, uh, those, uh, to give grants to, to those courses that are in the core. Um, so we would like to have a core that would cost nothing for um, uh, our undergraduates as they, as they go through the core. That may not happen, but at least it is a North Star and a, you know, is beckoning us and, and, and gives us a goal to reach, to keep striving for every day. So that's, that's, that's the seventh recommendation and I'll turn it over to, or no, I'm doing eight, recommendation eight too. All right, um, forgot about that. Um, the next is that um, was about uh, course marking and had to do with uh, SB 810 and what were the best practices. And uh, Michelle Reed, who had been on our group uh, librarian at, at UT Arlington, had written a, uh, a, a work, a paper on uh, this expertise on how to mark courses as no or low cost. Um, I know Art Brownlow, who's on this call too, really helped us with that aspect of the report. And it, it delineated some of the key challenges as well as some of the concrete action steps that institutions, and, and we will, are we gonna be able to release this, Rebecca, to the group after? Okay, I just wanna make sure because then you'll get more detail. So this is, you know, you're probably asking, what are those recommendations? They'll, they'll be in the report and, and, and uh, um, uh, and then, of course, uh, our, our recommendation number nine is one that I push for a lot was to develop an ongoing OER legislative strategy. And the reason, and I push for that at our OER, and I will continue, because if you look at any of the states that are quote unquote successful in open, it's because they have legislation behind it and taxpayer money behind it. And so it, be, it becomes not only a priority of the institution, but a priority of state governance. And so, um, we are looking, and, and again, as these meetings are great uh, venues for us to get together and really start talking about what we can do together in the legislative, because I, 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 I genuinely feel if we want multi-million dollar investment, it's gonna, not going to come from our schools. It's going to have to come from the state. So we need a strategy. Uh, we need uh, UT system to, to, to lend its considerable uh, heft uh, with legislatures, legislators. They have heft, right, Rebecca? We do, don't we? 
<laughs> Depends who you ask. I don't yeah, know. Yeah, yeah. So um, in recommendation number 10, um, you know, we wanted a follow-up group to implement and oversee uh, the momentum strategy. So this includes, you know, goes back kind of dovetails with recommendation one. I mean, we do want financial uh, considerations and we did ask for a, a specific number, which basically was over a, a $1 per student um, uh, across the UT system. Wasn't that $1? And then, I, oh, oh no, $2, $2, right? I, I don't remember. Do we I ask for dollars and two dollars uh, that we asked for, and uh, for OER, and that we thought that was a very low bar for invest. But we haven't had that meeting with Regents, and you know, again, this is where we have the politics and in, involved that we need to. Uh, but yes, this is we we would like another group to come here uh, to come in and oversee and enhance this strategy, and somebody to, you know, a, a permanent group that is always thinking about this. So um, this report uh, uh, has legs. All right, with that, I'll turn it over to my colleague, uh, Rebecca, and she can kind of tell you about where we're at in, in, in steps. And I'm, just, I'm still trying to process, Dean, that you said we asked for money. We didn't ask for a particular number in this report, but that's okay. We'll talk about that later. But here's here's the, not so in the here's report. The not in the report, we, oh. but we did talk to Milliken and yes. he asked generally oh, when, yeah, we told him. Yeah. In, in, when we right. talked to the kids. That's right. what I mean. So, okay, good. Um, so, but here's what you need to know. So we delivered this to our, to Chancellor Milliken six months ago. It was a very, it was very positively received by him. And then it kind of stopped moving. Um, so this is, it turns out that university systems are large bureaucracies and the pace of change can be slow, which won't surprise any of you. Um, in some ways, this is a story of how large scale systemic change takes place. And it's an on, it's a work in progress. So we, really things were rather slowed down. We knew we had to vet, the chancellor clearly wanted to vet our report and recommendations with the UT system academic presidents. Um, so that happened very slowly. It didn't really happen until the last couple of months. It was sort of on an agenda and it constantly got pushed off agendas because, well, for good reasons, things like COVID and, and other <laughs> issues. Um, and then I also got, I got a new boss. So the, a new executive vice chancellor for academic affairs who kind of had to then be socialized into understanding what this task force was, what it produced and how it um, might move for, how we might move forward with the recommendations. So we did a fair amount of vetting. And at this point we have a com commitment after um, vetting with institutional presidents and provosts in particular to move forward on four priority areas coming out of our recommendations. Um, so we are going to focus on the best practices on OER and course materials disclosure and tr try to provide support to our institutions to do that. I mean, it's, it is complying with state and even some federal laws. And yet it's clearly for those of you trying to do um, implement SBA 10, it's very labor intensive. Nobody quite has the staff to do it. Um, and so we wanna at least um, build again, part of this is awareness building and education on getting others involved in their responsibilities to do this. Um, and then we also want to incentivize the faculty engagement in OER. We, Dean also, Dean, from, uh, from a system perspective, we're not going to even tell institutions they should change their tenure and promotion policies, but we're going to talk about it with them. We're going to bring this to our faculty um, academic council and, um, and they will hopefully have these conversations. There's a lot of support out there for doing this. What I don't know to, to, for talking about it and, and laying out the case for why you should change your tenure and promotion policies, I don't see a lot of action actually across the country. Um, it's interesting to me. I often get people, faculty coming up and saying, why don't you why doesn't system mandate changes that you know we start embracing more of the scholarship of teaching and learning or OER and in promotion and tenure? And I kind of say, well, you know what? That's on you if you're a faculty. You know, this is on departments, this is on deans and, and chairs and, and leadership and institutions. But we think there's a lot of awareness building we can do and the momentum is growing for it. We are gonna try to figure out that more unified coordinated approach as a system to working with commercial publishers. Again, leaving institutions lots of autonomy in how they do this, um, but really doing a lot of education. And we're going to work on those shared metrics for measuring OER, um, ROI and impact on student learning and success. And here's the thing. So these priority, these are the four priority 
areas that after six months, we were sort of got the commitments to move forward on. Um, and the truth is this work's already underway. I mean, you can see, I think, I think I'm not totally following the chat, but I know some of our campuses like, um, like Deanne and like Justin from RGB are, are weighing in with some of the things that are already taking place. We've already, we've already changed some of our tuition or our, our mandatory and non-mandatory fee structure to include inclusive access fees as a part of course fees that are publicized in, to students um, at the outset. So we we're already doing some of this. And so we will keep doing that amplification elevation of the work already underway and, and build the momentum. And we're going to pursue some funding opportunities. Um, we one of the things in the report, and here's the other thing I want to tell you, you're the first people to have seen this much of this report. It is not actually public yet because we, we had an embargo on it before we could share it. We are hopefully gonna actually put it on our website tomorrow or next week. We have a link on one of our slides here um, and maybe you can just move on Dean. Um, we can, we, it's actually the, the next slide. We have the link, that's just to a description of our task force, but we, we finally got permission to make this report public. The report references a website information hub, which will serve as the repository um, for a lot of the materials we reference in the report that actually aren't in the report quite yet. We have a lot of work to do. We actually have a very limited staff at the UT system who's been able to um, even do the web design for this site, for this information hub. But we're excited to be at least finally being able to publish our report and recommendations. And that in itself will be a um, action and constitute action on, on moving forward. Um, I know we don't have a lot of time. I wanna stop here. We did have some questions for you. I don't know if, you know, the questions were quite general about how your system is or institution is building more systematic engagement with OER. I know there's incredible activity for so many of you in your, um, in, at your particular institutions that's, that's really underway and very powerful. And we're kind of interested in what's working well in terms of the case making and capacity building. Um, and then what are some of the particular challenges? If so anyone people, wants to answer those questions, you can place them in the chat. And while we're waiting, um, I'm assuming that uh, most of the questions that did come up in the in the chat, um, hopefully, were answered by the presentation. I know uh, some of the things that that were asked, I did see uh, in the presentation as well. Um, but one of the questions, um, and you know, may or may not have been answered, but you know, is how much or is there uh, any intent on harmonizing the course content in, uh, across the system, the UT system? That's a great question. I, I think um, it would have to happen. It would have to be organic from the institutions wanting to do it. Um, but we think when we start having discussions around um, the sort of low cost, you know, Z degree equivalent kinds of discussions around the core curriculum, I think there would be opportunities. If we were able to get some funding, I think we could put together affinity groups to do that very thing. We wanted to sort of try to put together disciplinary groups of faculty um, across the system working on homework sets, for example. But you know, no one quite has the bandwidth with that for that without some real support. The other thing I know there was a um, point about working with other systems and the a and system trying to jumpstart some activity. I talk all the time to James Hallmark, who's the vice chancellor of academic affairs in the um, a and system. And he's, I'm actually, he hasn't seen this report either. I will share it with him. You know, this report, it's, it doesn't have as much, I think, practical information as some of you might be looking for. It really is about case making um, and how you build capacity. And then for our particular system, what were the priority areas where we knew we could coalesce thanks to the incredible engagement of the task force members to move forward um, and continue the, the momentum building. Wonderful. Um, I have uh, a message from Deanne Ivy. She said, uh, in response to your discussion questions, expanded and stronger campus partnerships, academic innovation, the library, the bookstore, the registrar, and of course, student government. 
Yeah, I would, I would, I would, uh, you know, Deanne and I are colleagues at the UTSA, and uh, I will say that is, um, you know, as we talk about more practically oriented uh, advice, and, and not across the system, but in your local university or local uh, uh, college, um, yeah, the, if somebody asked me, like, well, how do you get started, is, is you just need to start educating people. You start taking every opportunity to talk about the problem of college affordability and this solution. It's, it, I think I said in one of the other um, uh, sessions uh, when I made a comment is this is, this is an e, to me, I don't know, it, it seems like an easy sell. The, there's a problem that everybody has run into, costly textbooks. It's something we all wanna solve, you know, making higher ed more affordable. Um, and uh, it, it, it completely aligns with the mission, at least of you know, the UTSA libraries, but I would say librarianship in general. I think librarians have found themselves along with teaching and learning centers or whatever it's called on your campus, academic innovation um, as leaders. But you know, once you start making that case, you get student government, faculty, your provost office, other people get on board and the more you get that momentum and I'll just have to give credit to, to uh, uh, Deanne, uh, she's done a lot of that relationship building. And uh, that, that to me is the key to uh, uh, really scaling OER at your institution. And, and, you know, I mean, there's no substitute for, you know, pounding the payment. Of course, we've, we have to pound the Zoom now, but... <laughs> <laughs> going office to office and talking to people, going to departmental meetings, letting people sit with OER textbooks and that sort of thing, so. Okay, all right. Well, I wanna thank you both for presenting uh, this phenomenal package to us today. Um, I'm really looking forward to uh, actually what comes out of this because you know uh, we are also a part of a system as well, uh, also trying to you know jumpstart OER on our own campus. So thank you all for attending today. Um, best of luck in all your endeavors and um, hope to see you at some more sessions. Thanks, everyone. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you, Sandra. Yeah. You're welcome.